Greetings ladies and mental gents and welcome to my channel, where I like to make audio narrations of stories from across the internet. In this series, we'll be focusing on a web novel called There Is No Epic Lucha, Only Puns, from the website Royal Road. And in this video, we'll be doing chapters 53 to 55. I hope that you enjoy. There Is No Epic Lucha, Only Puns, Chapter 53 divine bobbing. There was a sense of satisfaction Delta felt when she had seen Grimm had frozen in shocked awe at the sight of her jungle. From the entrance, it was now impossible to see beyond the trees now. It was so different from how it started, an empty box of a thriving land of green. Grimm's neck craned as the trees now formed a solid-looking walls of nature towering far above. He inhaled as the wyam tree above softly sprinkled its green manna on him with a swish of its almost willowy branches. Minty, he mumbled as he took a few hesitant steps towards before stopping. I'm going to have to get past the pig guy in the way out. Ugh. I should have brought a G on away, or maybe an actually asked dad for an escape scroll. But then he would ask why I can't exactly say that I was going into the dungeon. Grimm sighed aloud. Maybe you should just not come to a dungeon and cause trouble. Well, other ones might try and kill you, to be fair, but I really, really tried to make your life easy to let you walk out. Delta huffed, which made the boy pause as if hearing something just not out of hearing range. Creepy jungle. He said finally and Delta raised a brown brow at his back. Oh, do explain how my cool jungle is creepy. It's pretty and green as frog people and bees. She listed with her fingers and stopped as the grim frowned at the trees. There are no birds. I never knew trees could be so bad without things living in them. He shivered and began to move down the thin path that was cut through the blooming wild bushes and patches of grass that grew slightly on the path. Data stared at Grim and then stared at her trees. She listened, but sure enough, the silence greeted her other than the distant roaring of the waterfall. Frick, I forgot about the ambience to my jungle. She cursed at herself, and then she stomped after Grimm with a hint of shame hovering over her head. The damn kid had done nothing but point out weak spots and insult her dungeon, and he had the gall to complain to her. Delta glowered, and until Grimm lost his backpack, Delta would tolerate him. Not that the kid had really anything else to offer more than stress at this point. Great Mushy slithered his thorny tentacle around the enclosed space as the box splashed repeatedly in his face. The issue was twofold in the fungi monster. One, the box was ever so bright, and the creature that had lived naught but in the darkness parts of the mother's dungeon, this was beginning to hurt its eyes. However, as the light blinked on and off, as if revealing a great to someone unseen audience, the mushroom monster found himself sort of enjoying the light. The second problem was the issue of the fact that Great didn't know how to read. He had pondered for this for a moment before he closed his eyes. That was not strictly true. Great could listen to the music that flowed from Mother, note after note. What were these squiggles and words but notes of the voice? Great blinked as his eyes opened and hissed and cackled. He pulled on Mother's glowing being and the sound of pulsing joy. Music is the key. Letter by letter, he began to softly hiss out the message on the box. Great and Mushy has reached the requirements to evolve into a unique evolution. Practice musical arts, pushed vast violent nature to seek greater heights, lured someone in with a soothing melody, listened to over a hundred songs. Would you like to evolve into Mushroom Maestro? You cannot turn back once you choose this path, so please consider carefully. Yes, no. Great flicked the vine with an idle thought. With so little guests, Great had nothing to do but listen to Mother's music to pass the time and to try to imitate the sounds on his own. Who knew if he could pay off? Evolution, yes. He had experienced that before. From the runt of the tiny sweater to his current self. Such growth, such potential. Mother had given them the tools to achieve this. Her open heart filled to the brim with the joyous music was something that he carefully pulled at. He was scared that if he became greedy, he would damage her. The thought was unbearable, and he clenched the vine and pierced his own flesh in agitation at the thought. 
great was the one of her first, something that he had great pride in, and while he may not be as loved as his brother, Mr., he tried to impress Mother in his own way. She liked his music, and that made great love it more in return. He had never loved before, and the feeling itched at him, like insects and his cap. Itchy, but not unwanted. This was his chance to make Mother even happier, and for Gray to see how far music could take him. If any fool got between him and the music he sent to Mother, he would show them why he was the more dangerous brother by far. Yes, he hissed with effort, drooling acid at the effort. Very well, your current space is not ideal. I'll pull at the ambient manner outside to fill your more fitting space. This will tire me greatly. Please do not attempt to move or sing. The words, after he sang them out, made great pause with a little worry. Heh <laughs> you can trust me, I'm big sis after all. It didn't do much to assure him, but he had no way to back out now. His body tensed as the energy rushed through every pore of his spongy skin. Great hissed with surprise as his insides began to twist. It wasn't just himself that was twisting, but the very whole way itself. Great hissed with some discomfort and began to grow, stretching and stretching higher and higher, and the tunnel that had been so stanchery bulged around him as if made of water, pushing space in odd ways that made music great that he'd never heard before. His body was moved as the tunnel was stretched wider and wider, something solid looking rised out of the ground, and his body was pulled gently onto it. Great, no, he was no longer merely great. He breathed a loud rattling hiss and the only thorny tentacle buried deep. Deeper and deeper, then he spread. The mushroom, formerly known as Great, began to shriek with sounds that made everyone on the floor pause with a startled surprise. Melodical, maniacal laughter filled the peaceful dungeon. It poured out of every wall and floor to fill every room on the first floor. Oh yes! Came a rich and powerful purr. That was when the mushroom noticed something else. Something wonderful. My, my, I didn't see the fuss about all this Hubbard Bubba speaking nonsense before, but now that I tried it for myself, well, what can a shroom say? Hello, ladies and goblins. This is your new and approved star of the first floor. Maestro, let me play you an introduction. He said, knowing, just knowing, that he could be heard all across the first floor. His hands began to tap in the natural drums surrounding his body thrummed. I call this little number. Welcome to the jungle. The maestro laughed with a smirk. He plucked gently and many cords attached to his cap, and that continued to the ceiling like lifelines, making string-like sounds. You don't have to tell me, I already know that it's absolutely wonderful. He laughed as he let his tongue, a thorny vine, lick his lips. He had been worried that he would lose his threatening appearance, but if anything, it only became more beautiful. Beauty, such a concept that never occurred to Maestro. Music, beauty, light, action. Maestro had just sat there and have it all. He spun, and the beat was pumping out, traveled down to the second floor, where his roots finally reached. I hope that you're listening, Mother. Your superstar son and her blow for the dungeon is popularity sky high. With your love, Mr.'s cuteness, and my voice, no one can stop us. He called with a powerful laugh. Maestro fed the spiders a little bit more music with one of his handy new mouthpieces as they seemed to respawn with heavy need to dance. Maestro was all too happy to supply. Mother's delightful shout come from just below. Maestro looked around surprised to see how big he'd become. The ziggurat that he was now resting on was the giant room might have added a few inches to the fact, but Maestro brushed that thought off. Ah, Mother, do contain your excitement. My new body is still cooling. He flexed his new hands and adjusted his new shelf around his neck. A flesh accessory piece. So this charming and fitting to his beautiful form. Mother was still screaming with delight, and she was now rushing out of the room. Maestro covered a shy smile at her action. Mother was going to tell everyone about his new form. He hummed and then burst into song with a deep vibrato. 
daughter was still shrieking in horror as she fled back to the second floor. The singing followed her as it seemed to pulse out of the ground. She just had been following Grimm, and he was getting lost in the jungle path, where he had stopped to take a food break when he spotted one of the few benches Delta had made. Pulling sandwiches had a drink after scouring at the bench for traps and tricks. Grimm had frozen along with Delta when the music, the voice, had appeared. Delta found Grimm exactly where she had left him. Why are the bunnies and bees the only cute things that I make off right the bat? She whimpered at the sight of the great mushy's evolved form haunted her. The demonic mushroom sitting on top a stone pyramid thing, long thick vines spreading everywhere like some grotesque alien hive, and were infecting her walls with odd molds and singing while doing it. He had looked at her and seemed to smile. The maw of death and the eyes of a devil greeted her. Fangs, hands like spears and chew like gross that acted as a choir surrounded its body. Tons of tiny, little screaming mushrooms all turned to her in unison. She trembled as the hearty sound of beating drums with pulsating thumps filled the jungle, giving it a heavy feel of energy. Okay, this is getting weird, and all I got so far was the ghost cat thing, Grimm said to himself as he packed his stuff readying himself to set off again. How do you think I feel? This is my dungeon. Delta complained pointlessly to him. Grim focused and snapped off the nearby branch to start marking a path as best he could. Delta couldn't be mad at the idea because she was too busy being scared for her life. It wasn't long before Grim found the river. Ugh. Grim shuffled back from the sight of the soft current. Delta blinked when Grimm didn't instantly pull out some magical river dryer or magical bridge. Damn it, there has to be a bridge or something. A vine swing, maybe. He asked aloud and tread carefully at a fair distance away from the river's edge. The way he moved reminded Delta of herself near her, well, everything. Moving slowly enough to not burst into a panicked run. He can't swim. Delta muttered with a sigh. That was a real shame. She was kind of hoping to have him lose a few more of his things in the river's waters. Something big moved near the surface of the water, and Delta spotted Rail briefly before he sank to the bottom of the river, where he blended in with the murk at the bottom surprisingly well. Delta nodded with approval at Rail's diligence. If Grimm did fall, he would be safe at least. If the frog kept this up, he might unlock some special evolution that could save people better. Delta paused at the image of Rail evolving into some three-headed frog sea serpent to do his job better as she repressed a whale. Please grow some more water wings or a whistle, she prayed at the moving shadow. A log. There was no bridge for a safe bridge crossing or even a shallow space to cross. Grim gnashed his teeth with a furious scream barely escaping. Water, water! Grim could not stand water in greater amount than what was needed for hygienic purposes. He glared at the sarcastic signpost declaring a river and warning of being wet. Rainy days, water fights, swimming days in summer, floods of any water-related magical incident like the great cheese flood of the winter four years past. The sheer presence of water made his already weak power non-existent. Grimm's power didn't work with damaged paper. Torn was fine if it wasn't too ragged or rough, but wet paper was just as useful to him as it was to anyone else. This river posed a problem, and Grimm thought over his arsenal of items. He had a common rope which he could try latching to a tree to cross the river with, but he would have no idea what he might also draw the attention of if he hit accidentally. Plus, the new thumping drum that echoed out music was throwing his mind into an easily distracted state. He saw a few vines that looked like they had once been tied into odd knots to swing easily into the trees, but they weren't something Grum was willing to trust just now. So he had two options, the log or follow the river to the source and hope for a way around the problem. Grum turned and marched, ignoring the log entirely. He spotted a few red bees floating around from some flowering plants and felt a little bit better. The signs of life were better than the silence of the jungle and the beating of drums. He carefully moved around the bee, lest he anger it and its hidden hive somewhere. After all, the only safe place from a swarm of bees 
was under water. Grim picked up a pace and the land climbed slightly in height as a roaring noise became louder and louder. He perked up when he saw the blood-colored rabbit rush past out of the corner of his eyes. A blood hare, Mum makes the best stew with those when she can get the meat. She said with a large smile, the memory of his mother cheering him up immensely in this lonely place. He stopped and scowled at his antics. You're an adventurer, get a grip and focus. One second is not paying attention and you're dead. He reminded himself harshly. Excellent advice, while not currently a problem, awareness of the world is key. Came a soft voice from the shadow of the large tree. Grim spun, hand reaching for the knife that he had already lost to that mushroom at the entrance. Who's there? he demanded, peering into the shadows to see the figure sitting on a giant exposed root of a tree. The figure looked relaxed as they stared down at Grim. A wooden mask of some staring beast covered its face. The body was mostly covered in simplistic dark runes and pants, and the exposed skin that Grim could see revealed that he was dealing with no fellow adventurer. A watcher, you traverse this jungle, and the jungle traverses you in return. Timid, but not afraid, a brave rabbit. The figure mused and Grim felt a heavy weight of his backpack. He had to reach for something he defend himself. I'm not a rabbit, I'm a person, an adventurer. He denied and the figure merely tilted his head. Oh, what does an adventurer seek here that is a rabbit does not? A soft voice, the female voice, continued. Grim gave her a flat look. Riches, magical items, books, rewards, you know. Things dungeons are supposed to have. He stressed the last few words and pointed criticism. The woman, thing, stood and easily hopped down to the ground before Grim. He backed up to the river, bubbled, with some warning behind him. The woman merely turned and walked towards the sound of the waterfall. Riches, have you not gained any of those? She pondered politely as Grim scowled. I got disarmed by a mushroom, tied up by spiders, chased by a mouse around a room, discovered a secret passage filled with some acid-spitting thing, got chased by a boar, shot it with arrows, had to trick a boss, lost in this jungle, I can't progress because of this river, and now I got some mask-wearing wise woman trying to waste my time. He waved his arms furiously before he stopped dead. A woman here would mean that she was part of the dungeon. That meant that she was a monster. He had just mouthed off to the second floor monster. Grim went still as the woman turned back to him. Did these not teach you of valuable things? She prodded gently, and the wooden mask hiding what sounded like a smile. Grim opened his mouth to argue, and then paused. The bowl slammed down, and Grimoire roared as with triumph as Mary became rapt. Don't dismiss me as if you are stronger. Don't turn your back on me. I am Grimoire Pictus, and I challenge you, you arrogant son of a bitch. I... He trailed off and then looked at the woman. Who are you? He asked again, and the woman clasped her hands together in front of him. I am Divina, a resident of the forest, a watcher and a guide beyond all else. She introduced. Grim hesitated before he spoke. Grimoire Pictus, kind of lost, if nothing else. He admitted, and the words spout like tar, not wanting to leave his mouth until he forced them out. Davina turned the corner and the thicket of trees, and Grim followed to see a waterfall in all of its loud fury. What is lost can be found, but you do ever so find such interesting things off the path you expected. Davina again sounded amused. Grim spotted something odd to the one side of the large pool of water at the base of the waterfall. Is that a goblin? He pointed and Davina's shoulders tensed slightly. A troublemaker, ignore him. She dismissed coldly. Grim winced as the goblin looked beaten, soaked, unconscious, and some were still cursing in his state. The goblin shivered as his magical staff spat some sparks out. Another signpost was nearby. Beware of falling water and Bob knew. As you can see, the water has risen and there is no dry way to cross the river, even here. To continue, you must face your fear. Davina pointed to the big pond of water. I can't swim. Facing my fear means dying in this case. Besides, the river is narrow down there. Why should I cross it here? Grim questioned with a narrow glare. Davina gently plucked a leaf from her tunic and dropped it onto the water's surface. It almost didn't move for a while, before it eventually softly drifted to the opening of the river, and it nearly the opening. 
It picked up speed and then was quickly lost downstream. The most obvious challenge is not always the most dangerous. I am willing to tie your rope to the rock across the pond so that you may use it to swim across and hold on, but you must be willing to make the swim yourself if that is what you desire. Davina asked gently, a grim grimaced at the idea, but then pointed to the side. Who's Bob? He asked suddenly, which made Davina tilt her head. A resident, but that is a risk that you are going to have to take, unless you wish to take your own path back over the log. She looked down and back at the river, as if seeing the log. Grim thought furiously. Can I ask this Bob if he can help me? Maybe he knows another way to cross. Grim tried to bargain. Grim thought he saw a shadow moving in the river into the pond, but Davina's words distracted him. Bob may be able to help you, I cannot deny this, but to rouse Bob, I will first ask for a payment for the service. Davina began smoothly and Grim winced. What kind? He asked a little worried at the implication. Davina nodded at his backpack. Something you do not still ready receive in this dungeon. I am not asking for much, yes? Davina sounded beyond pleased and amused. Grim felt like something was amiss, but Davina could have ambushed him, or worse. So he just had to wonder what the deal was. Grim pulled off his pack, and keeping an eye on the masked woman, began to search for something. Will Bob also need a payment? He asked a little sarcastically. There was a brief laugh, like a songbird or something just as melodic. Bob will not, she promised and Grim pulled out a few items that he was pretty sure that he could give away without too much hassle. I got a compass, some basic first aid manuals, and other books, a pot of some fire starter things, and a hand axe for cutting small things, a uh, water crystal for a canteen. He was going on to continue, but Davina held up her hand. She seemed to pause as if listening to something. The water crystal, explain its purpose, please. Grim looked at her. Grim looked at her, her form looking a little odd in the open exposed area, as if the trees themselves lent a part of a costume. I can drop it into some basic dirty water and purify it for drinking quickly, or I can channel some manner into it to make a source of water. It has some other uses, but that's depending on your skills and what you're trying to use it for. My crystal isn't high grade or big, so it doesn't do much and it'll last long. He offered honestly. Davina was calming. It was oddly bizarre, yet Grim was enjoying speaking to a friendly face that wasn't going to stick an arrow in his face. I would take the crystal for payment. She requested and Grim threw the clear blue stone that was shaped lightly like a piece of coral over to Davina. It was a sturdy thing, so it rolled onto Davina, plucked it up between the two large web fingers. Payment is accepted and I will now uphold my end of the promise. She pocketed the crystal and turned to the pool, stroking the water. Bob, you can appear now. She sang and Grim moved slightly closer, curious about the unseen creature. He spotted another goblin appearing from behind the waterfall, wearing some fur clothes and dragging a club sluggishly. Grim was about to ask who that goblin was before the pond bubbled furiously. Grim backed away and the water rose up in a huge column before the water pulled back to reveal a hellish worm creature as it shrieked into the air, easily drowning out the waterfall. Grim was rooted on the spot with some primal fear made him go very still at the sight of some superior predator. He was a rabbit and he was about to become this worm stew. It was just how it was, a real shame. Bob be a deer and carry the guest across the river. Davina called and the worm shrieked and wriggled, its body glimmering with a rainbow sheen. Bob turned to face Grim and it had no eyes. It reached down and Grim began to scream, a high-pitched noise and Bob screeched back. The beast was upon him and two small red crabs rushing down from Bob's head and grabbed Grim's backpack and loops as he yanked them into Bob's mouth. The pincers twitching like blades, Grim kept screaming, and then he was lifted on the ground was quickly left behind. His feet touching the solid ground a moment later, but Grim kept screaming and staring into nothing as the image of the moor repeated over and over. The Vena was beside him a moment later, and another creature, a shorter but very muscular frogman. You speak Bobian very well. He compliments your grammar. 
The frogman said, and Davina gently shook her shoulder, but Grim just took off in a fit of sprint, his voice becoming hoarse as he was still screaming as he rushed into the jungle. Rail looked at Davina, who was confused expression as mother's laughter filled the area with a loud cackling. Why did he not just use the log? He asked Davina. His nervousness around the other frog was a little less extreme now after some time and he wasn't sure how to really talk to her when she seemed to avoid his gaze. Davina took off her mask and gently dabbed the neck where the water trailed. She slowly swiped the wetness down on his shoulder with one finger. We wished to take the easier path, it would seem. I think that he will learn that some risks are worth it now. She answered with an odd voice a little heavy, as if they were trying to clear its throat. Rail patted his back easily. Your voice is croaky, more so than normal of our kind. You should rest and enjoy the new music. I wonder how Mother has made it happen. He asked and Davina slammed the mask back onto her face. Yes, well, I'm glad that is what you focus on. Music and how terrible I sound. Davina snapped and stormed off with a growl. Rail blinked and watched as she vanished. Rob trilled and Rail nodded. Female kind is odd. I do not understand what was wrong with them. I shall ask Mother soon. He beamed and sighed. I want to rescue the screaming one. He muttered and Bob pulled a giant rock nearby into his mouth. And he Rail perked up. Yes, let's train with the rock. It's a good practice. He agreed and Bob began and pulled the rock underwater. And Rail attempted to rescue it. Nearby, Swa twitched and the two red crabs began to pinch his nose when he cursed so that the goblin's magical staff began to leak charred carrots. They faded after a few moments, but the crabs did it again, and the staff made the odd noise that it flew off into the distance. They danced with laughter as they set off to find something else to do. They stopped and followed a noise, a noise of Grum still screaming. End of chapter there is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 54. Picnic. Pull Wilhelm. Delta stared as the giant ape tried to stretch out his fingers out of the tunnel, still father, barely missing the fleeing Grim. She frowned as the giant beast gave up and pulled his arm back into the tunnel, back into his tiny space. I didn't even think. He can't roam or get out of that tunnel. I'm going to have to fix that. It's the first thing that I'll do. Delta promised Wilhelm, and the ape's serious face peeking out of the entrance of the circus before he abruptly moved back as if jolted. Manner is thick, the core has to be in that tunnel. Grum moaned as he walked another few steps away from the circus. Delta sniffed at the air, but didn't really see any difference in the manner here than anywhere else. Delta tried very hard not to think of the fact that she hadn't showered in a while. Didn't manner have a smell? Did Delta smell? Apes, monsters in the water, and talking frog people. I, this place isn't a dungeon. It's some dangerous wildlife sanctuary. Grum grumbled as he collected his nerves again, hugging his backpack tightly as if to shield it. Delta merely shrugged. Would you believe if I told you that most of this was all an accident? She offered, but paused to really look at the boy. His face. I, damn... I don't feel great. Did I brush some dangerous prawn? Was the worm thing poisonous? Grum mumbled as his flushed face peered around the jungle as if trying to sense danger. Hey, kid, you look terrible. Have you got any water? Dalton moved closer to get a better look at Grum's complexion, but even if she did so, Grum suddenly recoiled and swatted in her direction, her eyes catching the movement at the last second. W what was that? Orange mist. Some toxic thing. He hissed and covered his mouth, looking wildly around, not long able to see Delta. Delta backed away slowly. The heck, he saw me. Delta muttered while Grim pushed his back against the tree to protect his back. She moved closer and again Grim tried to fend off this orange mist. Delta felt a little lost of what to do now. Grim was not faring well, but if she got close, he began to panic. She needed some way to see the problem from the distance, and doing that required dungeon sight, the numbers. She finished out loud. Grim was twitching, and he seemed to slide down the tree slightly. Screw it, the kid is going to kill over at this rate. Delta snapped at herself and pulled on the world around her. 
Like always, it tried to overwhelm her every sense, but Alta pushed back against the tide of information, pulling and pushing until the numbers didn't so much overwhelm her, but slightly overlay was what she saw with real vision. The number vision was interesting when it wasn't trying to drive her ice pick into Delta's brain. So, with her head cracking open, or so how the pain felt, Delta stared at Grum. Grum was turning orange. His natural creamy yellow manner, like the old loved book, was becoming tinged with orange. Splotches spread over the parts of his manner and aura. Grum's manner rebelled, and the orange manner simply kept coming. Delta could see with every inhale, more and more mana flowed into his body. It didn't make sense. None of the others had seemed to have this problem. Delta suddenly hesitated. None of the others, bar Rudy, had been in the dungeon as long as Grim. The teenager had been slowed by every obstacle and every monster, along with his own caution. Even with all of the visitors together, not even Dio would have been in her for as long as Grim had been. Natural infection. He needs to get out of here. Now, Rennie. Delta snapped and the vision closed, spinning with a desperate plea on her voice. She hadn't even finished spinning before the mime was before her. He tilted his head to bow and then looked at Grim. The boy had gone very ill. Rennie, I'm done being mad and I wouldn't ask this if it wasn't needed, but please, you need to get Grim out of the dungeon, she requested, waving her hands in a panic set in. The mime nodded and turned to Grim. Stay back, I have an ancient curse memorized, and I'll reduce you to paste. Grum threatened and he began to cough, ruining any chance of his threat working. Delta stared at him. Mana overdose? Was such a thing possible? It was then that a thought occurred to Delta. If she made a goblin but overcharged and ignored the mana requirement cost, what would happen to the goblin? Would it be a super goblin, or... She stared at Grum's shaky facade and broke, and he just began to throw the nearby rocks at Rennie. His throw was weak, and he was growing paler. What would happen if a mana cap was broken of a person or a creature? Growth or death? Rennie slowed and raised both hands in a peaceful gesture, but Grum was a full blown panic mode. Rennie bent down, and Delta froze as he seemed to finally catch Grum's eye. Hey, who are you? he demanded. Rennie didn't reply, and then smiled, showing his maw. Delta watched as Grim took off without a word back towards the river. Rennie turned and saluted. Rennie, I meant carrying him out. He's going to hurt himself in that state. Delta groaned, and the mime paused and then looked after the boy with a quick burst of speed, which of course meant that Grim tried to run even faster. Delta could only watch as Rennie was forced to wait for Rail to fish the boy out of the river. I hope that we can get someone to come pick him up. Where is Quiss or Rudy? Usually they're here for any drama, Delta said suddenly, talking aloud to put her restless energy to use. She had a bad feeling, but tried to ignore it as she was distracted by the blood-curdling mushrooms and the starlight mushroom tried to grow in the same spot, bashing the caps together gently with the breeze. It almost looked like a fungal combat, but Delta was sure, sure, that it was just her imagination. Mushrooms couldn't wage war, just outgrow one another. Grim was plucked from the river, and Delta couldn't help but feel annoyed. His backpack was still tightly in his grasp. I can't steal from a sick kid. Rudy is going to owe me so much new stuff. Delta sighed. Delta is going to owe me so much new stuff for putting up with this crap. Rudy crossed her arms as she sat in a decently comfortable chair. She tilted the chair back as Mr. Jones gave her a polite smile. I've heard much about this Delta. However, we've been studying the mass downfall of the 22nd King of Valuron. Can anyone in the class tell me what eventually caused his reign to end? Jones asked the empty room. Only Rooney was sat one in the student desks. So she was stuck her hand up. Death, marriage, politics, religion, dragons, ego. True ruler came back from the dead, fell down the stairs, tried to use a world-ending artifact, thinking he was so special that it couldn't backfire. Oh, oh, maybe he died because he was so boring that no one wants to hear about him, Rudy offered. You have your textbook right in front of you. The answer is on the page I opened the book to. All you have to do is look down. Jones encouraged. Rudy gave him a flat look. I'm not feeding your addiction to passing tests, she calmly announced and Joe signed. I am trying to complete your special education. 
Many rulers and gods have asked me to teach their children, yet it seems like you don't seem to understand why I am doing this. Jones sat at his desk and rubbed his eyes. The space in the classroom seemed to sag, as if a mirror of the owner of the building's mood. Everyone I teach has needed it, at one point or another. Knowing what I taught them has changed the world. I am the one with the highest knowledge of demons of existence. I do not spread the word of grammar like lower beings, nor do I praise the utter truth like the special ones. I am a guiding hand of knowledge. I go where I mustn't pass on the right education, at the right time so that the individual is armed to tackle their t- responsibility. Jones explained and really felt a migraine coming on. Then just give me the one lesson and we'll call it a day. She growled, Rudy didn't know two hoots about the knowledge or any other of her limbs or appendages. It sounded like a lot of being forced into something and doing what she was told to do. Two things that Rudy was vehemently detested. I do not know what it is people need to learn exactly. I can narrow it down to a few years worth of lessons, but the process is no means a hasty one. I do this because I must, not because I enjoy forcing you here. I enjoy being a teacher. Forcing a student to learn appalls me. I've failed if I have come to such a thing, but if I do not, I become disagreeable, and I happen to respect your attitude. Jones walked closer and picked up Rudy's textbook. I wanted you as a little girl all those years ago sitting here with those ribbons and an excited face to love my class. You did for a while then. You came to class one day and your love for words and knowledge was gone. You declared a pointless and I could never get an answer from you again. Mr. Jones said regretfully. Rudy remembered that day. Sorry, Mr. J. It was nothing to do with you. I... Forget it. Chris will be back soon and I'll get out of here, she said confidently. Jones gently put the textbook back down. I hope so. It would be nice to be surprised. I have something for you while we wait. Let's call it a free study for the moment. Jones winked and went to his desk to get something. He returned and placed a single sheet of paper on the desk before Ruli. She stared at her. Her own name written in an awkward pen was displayed. This was something you took a long time ago, before you lost interest and before you moved away. It's the... the thing I love the most essay. Crap. I could barely spell. Why does it have 97%? It's terrible, Rudy said with incredulity. I do not expect you to fly before you have even walked. Your first attempt at a serious effort, so much that I could feel it. As a teacher, I could be no prouder. Jones gave a small smile and really stared at it hand and back. It would have made my day to see that. Sorry, I missed it. Rudy replied quietly. I was tempted to throw it at your mother when you were sent away. I felt some spitefulness as a teacher and as the knowledge demon when you were sent away. But I refrained. Your mother had already given several people a thrashing that they would not forget even mentioning your name. I think I may have broken her with this. Jones mused and Rudy could read the first line barely. I love my mum the most. She makes me feel special. I love being her kid. We hunt rabbits together. Now I am just depressed, she announced, and Mr. Jones thought about it and pulled a sheet of paper from his pocket. Here we go. Enjoy. He beamed and Rudy looked down at the word search puzzle. Jones, I'm not eight. I don't think this is going to be really drastic. Oh, I see axe. That would be spleen, Rudy said and grabbed her pen. Jones shook his head and led Rudy to it. Pick, stop, and think about this, Mila warned, and she stood under the arch that announced the end of the village space proper. She looked furious. Pick itched at his nose with a single finger, and he looked down at the ground for a few seconds. Okay, I just did that and nothing has changed. I'm still going, so move your butt. Pick or gestured and his hands for her to shoo. But his bald head could feel the afternoon sun beating down. Mila's eyes went dark. Pick raised one eyebrow as he stroked the long silver beard. You're gonna bite me, girly? He asked with a little fear. Pick knew every emotion and reaction of Mila. The fellow elder and ex-adventurer was someone he had come to rely on like an extra limb back in the day. It was fair to say that as much as Mila could read him, Pick could see through her as well in return. 
he was about 70% sure that he was going to be unharmed if he walked past. Mila had a tendency to keep one guessing. You want to go back into that hole. Dungeon or not, it was still a pit. Mila grounded out and her arms crossed. Pick merely smiled. This was a delicate game. Their back and forward, too hard and none of them would snap. Too soft and one of them would be left with the same angsty state. Thankfully, Pick had started the fight with an ace up his sleeve. And the pit has my grandson, Mila, my blood. Pick pressed and Mila's lips turned thin. Rushing in blindly is not going to help. If you don't stir something from the depths of memory, you'll crush that poor dungeon girl. Delta, you can barely stop yourself from wrecking your own stuff. She counted and Pick rolled his tongue and his mouth before he replied. If simply going into the pit causes a reaction, then something has already very wrong. Mila, lose the stick up your ass and move. I'm going to get my grandson. You can come with me or you can stay here and glare at thin air. I know you enjoy it. Pick informed her as he walked past her. His exposed arms barely brushed Mila's skin, but it was enough to feel the sheer heat coming from the woman. Pick took a simple cap from his pocket and covered his warm head. You're burning up, Mila. I know you're not unusually this cranky. When's the last time you let go? Pick asked gently and the woman stiffened as though Pick had stabbed her with a class 9 restricted spell. Not since Ruri left with her father. You know that. Her reply was clipped, almost reserved. Need to unblock yourself, Wolf Hunter Mila, being napping too long. Holdy is looking great these days. We both know what he's been up to. Let's go and enjoy yourself. Go summon your man and have another kid or something. Pick snorted. Mina turned with a furious look on her face. I don't need to summon anyone to relax. You're balding jerk of a man. Mila growled and the next thing Pick knew, Mila's foot planted itself on his ass and he was sent flying down the road. Go get that idiotic boy of yours. Find some manners while you're at it. Mila yelled and stormed into the village. People jumping out of the way and Von the banker turned the corner. Umbrella in hand with some girl at his side. He stopped to say something to Mila, and even from this distance, Pick could see that Mila suddenly smooth herself out as she finally found what she was looking for. Von seemed to pause before he took three steps back. Pick grinned and left before the show could begin. He had seen the song and dance enough to know the routine off by heart. Pick turned his full attention to the task before him. He sunk his teeth into the idea that he may have to carefully move around a baby dungeon looking for Niall. Pick frowned. The kid hadn't been at school or in his room, and his father had been a loss after checking these two places. Pick felt shame as he tried to think of what may have caused his grandchild to go into a dungeon. If Pick was standing next to himself, he would punch the fool. Pick knew almost nothing about his own family. His own son, Pick, was confident about and to go on well with. His son's wife, he had trouble with. Details just weren't there. He clearly remembered her as a much younger woman than the beautiful lady she was now. Grim. Pick barely had flashes of a baby. Some strong flashes of a demanding tyke wanting a meteor summoning magic or a dragon for his birthday. A weaker memory of a quiet teen at the dinner table. Pick was sure he asked how his day was going most of the time, but Grimm never more than a weak shrug. When his parents had discovered he was gone, with a lot of family items, they had come to him right away. Pick rubbed his beard. His mother had been quiet as Pick's sons promised that Grimm was a good kid, and just a little bit unsure of himself. Pick could understand that. Everyone had doubt about themselves during their teenage years, and often long after, but Grimm's mother suddenly spoke up with only one thing to say. I don't think he has any friends. I ask him to bring him over, and he deflects. I ask him if he wants to go to some gathering or clubs, and he makes excuses. A boy came once, Dio, to ask him to play. Grimm just said no. My boy won't talk to us, but he doesn't have anyone else to talk to. What if he needed help and I just stood around waiting instead of acting? She asked bleakly. Pick rolled his tongue again as his stride picked up speed. The cost of what Mila, Aldi himself and Durance had done was still taxing him, but with the dungeon now in place, he had some breathing room. Pick tried to look at things as a professional as well as a grandfather. 
One goes into a dungeon because they want to gain something, or to die. Grim didn't seem to flicker and wane. The boy, in all of his memories, burned with a fierce flame. So what did Grim want from the dungeon that he didn't get at home? Pick felt guilt rise up harder as he neared where the dungeon was supposedly at. The only problem was that Pick was keenly aware of the fact that Grim had never been in heavy mana areas, let alone normal level. Durin's had been so thin on mana that the kids growing up in the place turned out a little incomplete. Nothing wrong with their mental abilities nor their bodies, but like the second set of veins that remained empty all their lives. The kids were usually exposed to enough mana over time to do small things or, if they had enough exposure, to the other sources like magical artifacts or the vast abilities of some of their parents, it would fall faster but natural mana in the air. Grim had never been exposed to it and Pick knew if he didn't get Grim out of the dungeon fast, he would be absorbing more mana than his body could handle. It was one thing that the core studies of Weising. Mana poisoning. It happened when inexperienced people went deep enough into a dungeon that it was beyond their strength to endure. The fresh kid that had never been in a dungeon could do fine in a newborn dungeon, or at least a fairly young one. In a dungeon with enough levels, if he went deep enough, he'd become ill and sick after an hour or so. Then, if he stayed, he would eventually die. In most cases, the first few floors were fine for the average person in any given dungeon, but the bigger dungeon, or more powerful, the faster the mana poisoning kicked in. For someone like Grim who never had been exposed to more than a thimble of mana compared to Norm, it wouldn't take much. Pick himself had to travel around to get some of the dungeons to expose himself to the right level of mana to get his body to adjust when he was younger. It was all part of the journey, really. The only good thing about the case was that it left no after effects when it survived. Pick never heard of mutations nor truly permanent effects to the standard case of MP overdose. He turned the last thicket of trees and saw the entrance to the dungeon. A large rising cave with two stone doors that looked to be vanishing into the cave's side. Pick slowed as the man with no visible eyes seemed to leave the dungeon, stumbled for a moment as he shrank and became a somewhat gaunt. Pick watched as he turned slightly and his arms were shivering grim. Pick moved forward carefully and forcing himself to step on twigs and kick stones. The silent being with the white face turned to him, still cradling grim, he seemed unsure of Pick. Hello my friend, my name is Pick, I'm here to fetch my grandson. Pick began slowly and he nodded to the sleeping grim, backpack held like some beloved stuffed animal. The pale man tilted his head. Pick's mind raced the area, the smell, the trees, the type of rock. It all brought back unpleasant memories. The monster and Pick's trained mind screamed, Monster, had brought Grimm outside instead of letting him perish inside the dungeon. That act broke everything that Pick knew about dungeons, even the most peaceful ones. Most dungeons were like nature. What died was supposed to die to feed the next cycle of life that they brought. To see a monster breaking that simple rule was making Pick beyond nervous. The pale man with no eyes and a cap with bells on it walked forward and held Grim out the boy weighed nothing. Are you a monster of dancers? He asked, wondering if there was a rare half-breed that was just hanging around. It nodded and Pick took Grim into his own arms. The monster backed up until he was back into the dungeon entrance, his form perking up and gaining some weight back. Contracted. You're a contract, Pick stated and the monster nodded, giving Pick a little wave as he turned to walk back inside. Wait. Pick called and the clown thing looked back with another tilt. I will pay you back for this. I will pay Delta back for this. Have my word. My name is Eunice Pictus, devourer of demons. I will return this debt, he said in a solid tone. The sun and clown merely nodded and the door closed on its own accord. Pick was left alone with his grandson. He looked down with a sigh of relief. The boy looked a little peaky, and Pick put him down to check his pulse, eyes, and tongue. Clear places to check for the odd MP signs that cause issues. Everything checked out fine, except for one thing that was more odd than worrying. Grimoire's tongue was orange. Pick was sure, sure, that there was nothing to worry about. End of chapter there is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 55, 
Heart of the Jungle. R, are you okay? Talza looked up from the bottom of the pond at Newsbox, hanging just below the water's surface like a moon. She took a long moment to think about the question. New, am I a crappy dungeon core? Talza asked with a hint of insecurity creeping into her voice. The fish around her seemed to crash into each other in a shock at their flurry of bubbles and splashing. The golden scale fish in particular almost leapt out of the pond, its brilliant scales gleaming as the water dripped off of it. Most likely, you have no control over what happens around you. You refuse to devour those that invade you on a regular basis. You handicap yourself in every aspect, in terms of traps, monsters, and instructions. You spent far too much on things that just will take far too long to bear fruit. You let your monsters do whatever they like, develop what they seem like useless traits, personalities, and honestly, you miss important details when it comes to your construction that if I didn't edit everything a little, it would be filled with holes, or worse, just collapse. So in theory, yes, you are a terrible core. Delta stared, her mouth hanging open. She felt a dark mood spilling over her rational thoughts. But who cares? It is far too late to take back what we've done. You are a great innovator. The many things that you have tried may not lead to explosive growth, but they are interesting enough to pass the time. You are not concerned about being a dungeon core. You wish to be a decent person. Everything around you becomes alive. You do things that I would have never thought of, and various results speak for themselves. We would be surely died when we are a mere dungeon core. Your kindness may have saved us all from the people of Durance. It does pain me to watch you fumble through everything, but I also feel great pride when things do work out despite that. I am new, master, of perfection, signs, and dealing with your antics. I can at least appreciate that you are using me to my full potential. I think many lesser dungeons would have squandered me, honestly. All around the pond, the fish danced happily as they seemed to agree with New. Delta looked around, a big smile breaking across her face. New, no, thank you. I, well, thank you. She said, standing with a sudden burst of energy. I assume this is because you nearly killed that annoying child. Delta deflated and the words stabbed into her, but New merely floated upwards, making Delta follow to read her text of words. Minor poisoning. I have heard it considered a problem since they were so small, but the boy was particularly frail in that regard. It is not your fault. You saved his life. The fact that you didn't take his bag killed me a little, but I'm a big, mature navigation unit. I can deal. So what exactly happened there? Just he couldn't handle my manner, or was mine just that bad? Delta touched down in the pond room floor with a perplexed expression. Nothing of the sort. Dungeon manner is rich. It is a good example as drinking. The boy had barely lukewarm milk all his life, and then he came here and drank more than his fair share of solid spirits. So Grim couldn't hold his manner to us. She smiled weakly at New. That was bad. You should feel bad, and then you should go back to your pond for a few days. I feel dirty. Honestly, how hard is it for you to stay if Grim wasn't a stout man? Or perhaps the bar was set too high for him. If you are going to continue to torment me with puns, you might as well make them good. Delta slapped her thigh as she broke out into a wheezing laughter. I... you heard nothing. Delta was wiping it to tear as she struggled to breathe. News blocks was blank for several seconds before he shuddered. Let us get to the business before I break and become even less like a menu and more like a punchline to some slapstick joke. Let us walk, well, float in my case, maestro, play something other than an obnoxious song. New seemed to talk to the wall, his words flashing. There was no response, but the upbeat music that had been on repeat suddenly turned to a slow piano and a long, relaxing saxophone. I liked that song, Delta grumbled. Yes. Far too much. Just because he promised to make you a theme song for your dungeon doesn't mean that we need to hear it every hour. Now, as far as you may remember, the brat was carrying out his fair share of lovely, wonderful items. I have been holding back the notifications until you were ready. Let us see. 
Delta had to admit the jazz music was making her feel rather smooth. She did a little slow turn as Nu began to pull up the notifications window. Last file with tiny traces of antidote absorbed. Weak antidote unlocked 15 mana. Delta remembered Grimm drank something in the spider room. She hadn't known that he'd thrown the vial away. Not that she would think her own spiders would rebel, but knowing about somewhere in the forest was a bunch of giant spiders, it was good to have options. So, is like a spider antidote or... Delta asked and new paused. No, it's a general weak antidote. It purges the body of magical and particular common poisons, or dilutes the more severe ones. It would be a pain if people needed a specific cure for every single common illness or infection. Delta gave him a long look. New, does this thing cure the common cold? She asked bluntly, and the box paused to think. I think it does. Delta was impressed. But not the magical, less common, but still average cold. This world is hell, but at least it was for nice people in it, Delta muttered to herself. Sand elf dust absorbed, average sleeping powder unlocked, can now be added to various traps, remember those things, or the items for selection of effects. 20 mana for a bag of powder or equivalent amount. Oh yeah, he was going to use that of Mary before he dropped it. Looks pretty handy. I mean, putting people to sleep is like chucking them out of the dungeon. Sounds great with their troublemakers. Dato exclaimed excitedly. I would think so. Just be careful. None of your monsters will have immunity except for the mushies, and we'll have to test how potent or long-lasting the effect is. Next thing is exciting. Water crystal absorbed. The effect of this thing has an interesting... It allows water to be produced as long as mana is injected. The crystal itself wouldn't last long in an actual world, but a dungeon-made crystal, while in the dungeon, is constantly being repaired, a habit I got into very early on around you. Unlike the waterfall and the river, which is just water being circulated back in on itself by a loop of tunnels that seem to exist outside of the room and cannot actually be accessed to be explored, the crystal will produce new water. It also means to unlock several upgrades for your current water features. Delta perked up and looked at back at a fish pond. Indeed. When placed in a groan into a body of mostly still water, it seems to, I'm currently not exactly sure, but almost bless or enhance the water. The issue would normally be that the crystal would erode very quickly as the water absorbed the crystal and it would take a few hundred or so of these weak ones to really go anywhere, but since we're dungeons and cheat, we can just repair the crystal casually over time and only need a few, which means the dungeons rule. Delta beamed. In layman's terms, yes. I suggest planting a few here in the pond and see what happens. For science, dungeon science, but we have more items to go before you zoom off to cause chaos or birth the new monstrosities like some mythological broodmother. No, I am not that bad, Delta protested as the music suddenly became dramatic piano, as if to contest her words. Please, I leave you alone for five minutes and I'll come back for you creating one of the back critters. In an hour, it'll know necromancy and demand wine or grapes and call us all servants as it acts like some lord of the castle. I know you. Delta felt it was very unfair. She had no control over anything, except for Mr. Mushy and maybe giving Maestro music and allowing the spiders to develop a medieval society. Giving Swa fire, buying Bob, contracting Rennie. What's the next item? She said grumpily. It's a bit odd, and I don't seem to be able to pinpoint exactly where or how Grimoire dropped it, but the item is still a bit abstract. Delta walked over to the pond and surface and it listened, paused, and looked back at New. Waddles ruffled his feathers as he watched the scene. Abstracted in what way? Some elemental thing. Did he drop some magical one-time-use thing? She prodded with interest. New looked for an answer. It's better if I just show you. Ability again. One times Liber Devourer. Delta reread about a dozen times, but the meaning of what New was trying to say was still not really becoming any clearer. How did we gain an ability? Did Grimm drop some orb or a skill book, or what? Delta scratched her nose. Below her feet, the school of fish swam around happily, around the sound of her voice. 
Honestly, I think it was because of him almost dying. If what you said was correct, about the dungeon manor almost completely overriding his own, then it would have been enough to uh, absorb enough of Grimm to basically gain an innate ability by emulating the process used when we take in items. I assume that usually these things might happen if dungeons kill people, but I... I will ask Sis. She may know. The box vanished and Hidu went wherever the inner system was. Delta frowned and sat down next to Waddles. Waddles, why do things keep becoming complicated? I barely get a hang on the number vision and now I can copy abilities. My eyes turn red and you'll keep me in line, right? She joked and the duck simply eyed her. Well, you're usually confident. What would you do now? She inquired and Waddles stood, tapped each foot once before he swam casually into the pond. He stopped near the middle. Delta looked down to the secret entrance to the second floor, hidden to those that had not caught the silver or golden fish. Waddles dived and nudged the tiny rock slightly above the entrance. He resurfaced and looked at her. Delta stared back. Waddles' eyes seemed to glow with annoyance and Delta looked down at the rock with confusion. Closing her eyes, she pushed her initial reaction of sighing and walking away, confused, to gather herself. Delta slowly pulled on the numbers, but as they rushed towards her eyes, she shut them. The flow seemed to stop in confusion. Delta mentally imagined on tugging on the lava lamp like balls of light. She pulled and felt it slid around her face and into her ears. Waddles wasn't a dungeon born. He was a dungeon enhanced. Delta frowned and the terms popped out of her head. Dungeon born enhanced. Waddles, Dark Drake, what are you trying to tell me? She said slowly, keeping her eyes shut and the energy still trying to bypass her eyelids. The crystal, put the crystal there. The voice deep and princely. Delta snapped her eyes open in shock and the number power dispersed like a dandelion in the wind. Delta winced as her ears began to ring with a high-pitched shrill noise. It felt like she was getting bad feedback noise. Waddles just looked at her. Right, good idea. Something to do while I wait. Delta perked up, rubbing her ears. She opened the menu to look at the list. Water crystal, a small crystal with the element of water imbued in its shell. Adding to water source will unlock something. Costs 25 mana and it reduces the total mana by 1 to sustain its existence. Delta had a sudden thought. What if I put a fire crystal in a forge or something? She muttered, but no one around answered for once. Some excitement, she dove into the water. The little stone was one of many, but it was almost flat, so she put her hand on the surface and purchased the water crystal. Like a seedling, a crystal the size of a screw poked out of the rock at a little crack and Delta stared at it. Ah, oh, it's cute. She declared and then there was an ominous crack as the entire stone split in half and the rest of the crystal pushed itself out like a growing coral. The entire bottom of the pond began to glow like a star had fallen into its waters. The coral crystal seemed to curve upwards over itself forming some umbrella style top. It almost looked like a... Delta took three steps back. Just, just, just a coincidence. But because it looks like a, I mean, Delta nervously stepped out of the pond. Good job in being busy. I see that you've managed to make a simple water crystal purchase into another Delta incident. Delta turned and glared. It wasn't my fault, she declared. Nu simply shook his box and ignored her protests. I talked with the system. It is beyond rare that you would ever get direct abilities from a human, even those with innate talents. It takes a special methods to mana infection, extraction or contraction to get the pristine template to obtaining an ability. As you have not gotten anything from Rennie or Waddles, I can only agree with Sis that you were lucky and the fact that Grimm was already so frail. His defenses, underdeveloped as they are, are easily to overcome. New looked down at the crystal in the water. Sis said something. I didn't quite understand this, but Sis said that your manner is particularly good at mingling with human manner. It takes a dungeon a long time to learn how to do more than simply poison people. Yours was doing that, but it was also doing something more. Sis didn't have enough data, but she was a mere hypothesis. We both think that you were trying to fix Grimm. Dazzle clenched her fists. I almost killed him. He didn't look fixed in any way. She argued, new nodded. We all are learning. Now you know what to look for. To gauge if someone is in danger from your powers. You won't let it happen again. You are far too nice for your own good. 
Shame. I could see a use for a library filled with rare powers. Then again, with you, you'll make something interesting happen. One guy related, no doubt. New sounded happy, but Delta felt like the words had a double meaning. She opened her mouth, but shut it as New suddenly shifted. The crystal is working. I'm seeing the available mana in the water rising. No results yet, but... Oh, I'm excited. Fish, tell me if any of you develop three eyes or grow legs. The school of fish all bubbled with understanding. Delta looked between them and sighed. Maybe it'll make the water tasty or something. It doesn't have to do anything too weird, she muttered. Grim opened his eyes and licked his lips. He tasted metal. He frowned and wondered if it bit his tongue or his lips, and he looked like his room. Hey son, don't move too much, you're okay now. Grim looked over and saw his dad, a big birdie with half-chewed spoon in his mouth. Mum is going to whack you for eating the spoons again. He croaked and dad cracked a smile. Your mum will do worse when she sees what I did to her cooking pots. I know how I stress eat. He chuckled. The easy tone set Grim's nerves on ease. He as expected, he still sort of did a punishment, as he was better maybe. A hot scorching sensation suddenly seared his tongue, and he winced. Hey boy, how are you feeling? came the voice of his grandfather. Grim stared at him with wide eyes. His grandfather came closer, and the hot sensation grew. Grim winced, but then suddenly he was held by someone, warm and soothing. His tongue cooled as he tasted, not blandness, but softness. He relaxed and Grim, but it also alarmed him that his mother pulled back. Grim, oh my boy. She whispered and stroked his hair back into place. Mum, my tongue, something is wrong. He blurted out and he ran his finger over his tongue a second later and all the adults shared a look. Grim, do you remember what happened? His grandfather asked and Grim closed his mouth and with a guilty look. I went to the dungeon. He put it simply, not adding any details in case he didn't know the whole story. His father raised an eyebrow. The dungeon you knew you weren't allowed to go to. He pushed and Grim shifted. My boy is fine. Well, not really. It's a bloody stupid thing to do, but we're glad you're home. The dungeon saved your life. Carried you out when you were about to bite it. The old man said, and his mother shot him a look. Pick, you know, I kicked you out for those annoying. She began, but something bubbled over in Grim, an urge that he couldn't stop, like a building sneeze. It was more than I could swallow, he blurted out. And there was an absolute silence in the room. Did, did, did you just make a joke? His dad asked it with surprise, and Grim honestly couldn't answer him. He was too worried that something else might slip out instead. Delta had a plan. It was a good plan, and she even had New go over it with a fine comb. After making the water crystal, the urge, the itch, to build and create rose up in her. Flaws and issues plagued her dungeon, her home. Grim had been a key to solving those. She watched as Mr. Mushy tried to contact his brother, Maestro, patiently, allowing him to wave his thorny baton around and letting his brother create a small, peppy melody. The giant, mind-breakingly and soul-scarringly horrible-looking mushroom was actually a lot sweeter with his brother now that he was fully developed his musical persona. He even let Mr. put a few pots around the pyramid like a room. Delta shivered near the door but felt better at the sight. Next time one of those punks swings a knife at you, come let me know and I'll show them how to use human skulls as bongo drums. Maestro winked at his brother and Delta fled as the image was too much. Cute, but it took its toll. She could upgrade the first floor more, but it was decent enough to slow and challenge people. Now the boss door was locked, Delta felt that she could focus on the second floor before adding more perfection to the first. So she flew down the stairs and after waving to her monsters, Swa and Num snoozing away in the camp, refilling themselves on the first floor's manor. Delta noticed it was lighter, almost drafty when fielding compared to the hot and moist manor of the second floor. Before long she stood in a high air, looking down at her almost alive jungle. Nu, fetch me a list of any critters that we have and phase out what we have on the first floor for now. She requested and a box beside her shifted. 
Common Bat 5DP. A simple brown bat creates two bats per summoning. This average size bat hangs about your dungeon to give it atmosphere and freak out the more easily startled adventurers. As basic creatures, they cannot evolve unless some unique elements are being absorbed by the dungeon. Forest Mouse 5DP. A simple mouse creates four mice per summoning. A normal mouse that lives in the forest and near towns cannot evolve unless special elements or items absorbed. Grass Snake 8DP A common snake found in most grassland areas. Its sharp fangs are a bite and is lacking any venom. They are a timid creature, running where they can, cannot evolve unless special element or item is absorbed. Durance J's 5DP A tiny sparrow-like bird that has a pleasant song, cannot evolve unless special element or item absorbed. I'll just assume to get the idea by now, sis. Cave Centipede, 1 DP, small hand length centipede with a painful, if harmless bite. Wood Lizard, 5 DP, a brown lizard that blends in well with the tree trunks and branches, fast and hard to spot. Black Owl, a small owl that lives in a cave due to its coloring, tiny sharp talons. Dwarf Mole, 5 DP, named not for its size, but the fact that most twice as big as the common garden mole, but for its squat shape. Beard, like head, fur, and a stubborn demeanor. Cave Crawlies 1DP, a small swarm of various tiny insects normally found in the forest caves, mostly for ambience. We didn't get any monster unlocks from these. Delta blinked with surprise. We still haven't gotten any spider monsters that we didn't self-develop, and we've killed a few giant monster ones. We seemed to get a crayfish monster from the crayfish, and we didn't have any water monsters yet. The system seems to give us a freebie, as if it were each new type of monster, and then we must work on the rest. I assume once we get more actual parts of a proper monster parts, or even maybe proper research, we can do something. Hmm. Well, I think that we have the power aspect covered, for the most part, but it's time for this jungle to get some ambience that isn't pumped over the speakers. She grinned and flexed her fingers. The floated down and began to make life. Mice scurried off into the bushes and through the plants. A few snakes curled up in the woolen tree. A few owls flew into the circus cave. Two lizards went very still on the tree together. A box appeared. By adding ten or more critters to the jungle, you've unlocked the following critters for the jungle. Alluring Dalbirds, a bird with orange plumage that draws people's attention with its songs and wordplay. 8DP Lotus Turtles, a turtle with an almost flat shell on top that looks like a frail piece of lotus. Floats all day sleeping, 8 DP. Vexing Foxes, playful foxes that like leading people off the beaten path. Have a habit of stealing shiny objects, 8 DP. Just a macaques, about the size of a large house cat. These monkeys get the name from the habit to screech, howl and laugh at people wandering through the jungle. Sometimes pelting them with fruit and other such jokes. 8 DP. Delta eyed her 90 DP remaining, not sure how much she should go crazy to fill her jungle with. She purchased a few sparrows and a dull bird. The Durance Jays were small and brown with red beaks, and they scattered with a flutter of excitement, but the dull bird looked up at her. It slowly spread its plumage and its orange chest puffed out. Ah. You're going to make this jungle so cool. Plus, you're good at singing and distracting people. Delta told it as if it wasn't already aware. Like two birds with one stone. It squawked and Delta froze. Did you just make a pun? She asked slowly. A bit of a bird brain had agreed. Delta couldn't hold back the smile that formed and news blocks glitched. I love you, she whispered. Birds of a feather, it sang and flew off. It's wonderful, her orangeness barely visible, like a tiger in the woods. Delta danced on the spot. I love this, making everything and the results, she said to New and the box side. Yes, it does have a good feeling. Shame it comes with so many puns attached. He grumbled and Delta flew to the tunnel, eyeing it. She focused on it and her DP dipped slightly as the tunnel stretched wider and wider. It looked less like a cave and more like a highway tunnel. After a moment, Wilhelm slowly walked out and looked around the lush jungle. Sorry for the wait, Delta called and Wilhelm inhaled and grunted softly. One of the new black owls was nesting in his shaggy hair on his head. It glared at the noise and flew back into the tunnel. 
Wilhelm took off eager to stretch his legs, his silver fur gleaming in the darkness of the trees. Delta looked into the tunnel and felt a rising urge to do more with the circus, but she had a plan. Damn it. She took off again and headed to the secluded spot that didn't have anything in it. But it was far from an entrance, but the water crystals had given her an idea. Just because she had a fire crystal option didn't mean that she could have to wait a fiery place to use it. Nice and easy. We don't want you creating a volcano. Actually, never mind. Do your best. I'm sure we can make a drainage ditch if we needed it. Delta stubbornly ignored the cheerful box. There would be no lava level here. She hadn't even done a proper water level yet. Everyone loved those. Delta felt the sarcasm grow thick in her own mind, and she shook it clear. If she had to have a water level, she would break the mold and make it bearable. It wouldn't be Pacific, or the design would not be made by someone who might be a little... Cra-si. Delta giggled, and wondered where her new Dilbert was. Be gone, Divina commanded, her greenish skin going blue with anger. The bird tilted her head at it. Okay, which way? It fired back and Davina held back a scream. Delta was sure that it was fine. She focused on the earth and the fresh green weeds, grass and empty soil. A second later, it was all gone. They didn't count the objects but the terrain, so it was easy to disperse. She whistled as the soil slowly covered by a smooth rock. It was a slow process because she was shaping the rock as it spread. The idea at first was to be a perfect bowl, but Nu had pointed out that there was no way to get out if one was too slippery or wet, so Dalta made little seats on the ledges for the people to sit on, curved for maximum comfort. Then once she looked good, she ringed the entire thing with a flat rock and spread out so someone got out they wouldn't immediately stand on wet soil. With that done, she filled the entire thing with clean, pure water. It filled up perfectly, no signs of a leak or such. New was too busy examining the piece to actually make a comment on anything. Then she placed the fire crystal and water crystal at the bottom of the water, covering them in a tiny wooden box with an open crisscross fence. The crystals gained curved upwards, but Delta ignored that. She waited for a moment. Come on, come on, she prayed, and then, as she was about to go check on the crystals, the water surface began to steam. She could see that the water level was rising up as the water crystal began to output more water than the hole could handle. No, any luck, she called, hoping that her friend would tell her good news. I'm looking, I don't see anything, hmm, I guess, oh, here it is, it just appeared. New sounded excited, and Delta hurried to open her menu. Her box was waiting for her. Would you like to make this area into the hot spring area? Cannot be undone unless destroyed. Delta hit the yes button, and the area finished with its went calm again. The water was now beginning to spread out. Unlike the pond, the excess water had no fancy dungeon space tunnel to flush into when it went somewhere that made no sense. In the menu, she found her answer. Hot spring area. Allow excess water to be removed and replaced with fresh water from the crystal 10dp. Increase the heating properties of the water. Minor injuries can be treated with recession 20dp. Create two small huts for changing on either side of the spring 15dp. Put a fence that separates the spring in half. Has a simple alarm to warn of intruders for spa users 15dp. Surround the spring with a bamboo to create more ambience, 15 dp. Let the water cure weak status effects, 30 dp, unlocked by weak antidote. Delta purchased the first one and the water slowed and then began to drain back into the spa. Lucky us, Sis was aware of what we needed and managed to work something out. I still think letting people rest so close to the potential boss room is problematic. Delta spent some mana and an offering table appeared next to both of the huts used for changing. Trust me, after fighting their way down here, they'll be grateful and getting something for letting them bath when who knows what they leave behind or bathe off for us to use for ourselves. Two's a win-win, Delta grinned, and knew was silent for a moment. I am impressed. Delta suddenly looked sheepish. I thought of it, she admitted, and Delta suddenly focused on what New had said before. Boss room. The second floor still had no boss. 
she remembered she had to choose a monster to become a boss. Fran had a special option because of bacon. So, she had made a boss room here, every monster on this floor might suddenly have wildly different requirements, and Delta would have to choose one of her monsters to become a boss, or make a brand new monster that she might not have such a good understanding of. Davina was a wild card, but too newly evolved. Rail was happy with Bob. Bob was, well, not something she thought of when it came to her jungle bosses. Wilhelm guarded the circus, and Rennie was a contract. The queen ran her kingdom and the rest were critters. The boss room was important, but Delta had not created enough variety or forces to really give the boss monster a proper thought. Better start now then, she mused and went for the far end of the jungle room with some nervousness. Created a tunnel into a wide room. Nothing stopped her and she didn't run into anything but empty soil. Delta breathed out with relief. The option came up and she should open open the menu. Would you like to make this a boss room? Cannot be undone unless destroyed. Sis, let's do this. Boss room created, candidates can now be selected. I wonder if the dire bird wants the job. Delta wondered aloud, and news box nearby fizzled in a loud protest. Delta was just do what she was always did when it came to making important choices. Jab random buttons and ask if anyone wanted a job with a polite tone. It hadn't failed her so far. End of chapter. That, my friends, concludes this episode. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author of the story, there will be a link below. If you wish to support this channel, there are multiple ways to do so, which will all also be linked below. But the easiest way would be to subscribe and share my videos as much as possible. And until next time, I hope you all have a good one. And I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.